Before I came here, I was taking LSD, marijuana, every type of dope you can imagine. Without our Pastor Jim Jones to teach me the right way, I would not be in college right now. Fingers, are your fingers numb? In your right hand. Reach the fingers out that are bothering you. There's far too many of you guys. Now, is the pain gone? You know you Well, the bodies of at least 409 men, women, and children, some shot to death, most apparently self-poisoned, have been found at the Guyana jungle camp of People's Temple. Among the bodies were those of the temple's fanatical founder, the Reverend Jim Jones, his wife, and at least one of their children. Jones had been shot in the head and was one of the few to die from a bullet wound. All the dead were believed to be Americans, many of them from the Bay Area, most had reportedly stood in line to take doses of cyanide-laced Kool-Aid from a large tub. The mass yeah, deaths Jim apparently, Jim apparently Jim occurred Jim about Jim an Jim hour Jim or more Jim after Saturday's ambush and left Bay Area Congressman Leo. James Warren Jones was born on May 13, 1931, in Crete, Indiana, to parents Lynetta Putnam and James Thurman Jones. Jones's father was a disabled World War I veteran with little interest in his son, and his mother was often out working. Women are called upon to leave their homes and take jobs. They discover that factory work is usually no more difficult than housework. Employers find that women can do many jobs as well as men, some jobs better. This solves the breadwinning problem for many families. As a result, Joan's childhood was filled with him, often left alone and being labeled as an outcast, who was, according to himself, born on the wrong side of the tracks. I never remember any of them ever touching or really having a good serious talk together or doing anything together. In his free time, he would read and study the histories of infamous leaders like Hitler, Mao, and Stalin, and would take note of how they rose to power and fell to it. Our red sun, Chairman Mao, appears before us. The glowing radiance of Mao Zedong's thought shines red in our hearts. How happy we are, how honored we are, the greatest teacher of mankind, Chairman Mao, is with us. At the age of 10, Jones's neighbor regularly took him to the Christian Methodist Church, and soon he found a home in the Pentecostal Church. Fascinated, Jones was influenced by the Pentecostal and Methodist preachers, whose charisma later influenced his own preaching style. We had what we called the Holy Roller Church out in the west end of town. It was where they shouted and ran up and down the aisles and got caught up in the spirit and it would get pretty wild sometimes. United States Army does not coddle communists. This committee knows that. The American people know that. Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. If it were in my power to forgive you for your reckless cruelty, I would do so. I like to think I'm a gentleman. But your Forgiveness will have to come from someone other than me. As an avid communist, when Jones witnessed the events that surpassed in the McCarthy hearings, 
he became angry and resolved to demonstrate Marxism through the church. He became further convinced of his mission when he witnessed how easily churches attracted people and money. Finally, with the help of the Methodist Church, Jones entered the ministry. He started off as a student pastor at the Somerset Methodist Church in a poor white neighborhood near Indianapolis. My husband had heard about him and we went to hear him uh, preach and were quite fascinated by him. Um, he was um, a very handsome, articulate, um, almost um, charismatic personality. He used a lot of repetition, a lot of um, drama, and had a good voice, good speaking voice, and uh, it was very persuasive. Jones quickly built a reputation of being a healer and evangelist, and leaning towards racially integrated services. But the church did not always support his ideals, so he started his own establishment. In 1954, at 23 years old, Jones and his wife opened their first church, the Wings of Deliverance. The egalitarian stance that Jones took for his establishment made him a leading figure in racial progressiveness. He went into the black areas of Indianapolis and, and brought them in. Uh, and he was the type of a speaker who would a appeal to the person who was wanting something uh, that they never had before in their life. When Jones was appointed as a director of the local Human Rights Commission, he was asked to keep a low profile, but instead he participated and cheered wildly at a meeting of the NAACP and Urban League. He helped to racially integrate churches, restaurants, the telephone company, the Indianapolis Police Department, a theater, an amusement park, and the Indiana University Health Methodist Hospital. Oh, I'm sure there were people who couldn't stand him. But by and large, um, he was admired and respected. He was still quite rational and did just a lot of good. He set up sting operations, which are designed to deceptively catch a person committing a crime in order to punish restaurants who refuse to serve black customers. When he was accidentally placed in a black ward of a hospital, he refused to be moved and even began helping by making the beds of black patients. The political pressures that stemmed from his actions caused for the hospital to desegregate their wards. When Jim Jones opened his church, most saw it as a glimmer of hope in the bleak circumstances of racism in the current America. To help build his following, he bought time on a local AM radio station to air his sermons, and held a convention with a well-known religious figure, Reverend William M. Branham, an author and healing evangelist known also as Oral Roberts, to draw crowds. As it grew in popularity, the church became more well known as the People's Temple. What have we done in a short time? We have four senior citizen homes that are the most innovating, the most beautiful you want to see. Now my home is stone blocked and there's not a piece of new furniture in it, but our senior citizen homes, they're elegant. And that's beautiful. Jim Jones had high ambitions for the People's Temple, evidenced by his efforts to expand his movement beyond Indiana. In one instance, Jones and his family moved to Brazil in 1962 to open a new temple in fear of a potential nuclear holocaust. Jones came back to Indiana when he heard from his associate preachers that the original church would collapse without him. When he came back from Brazil in 1963, he told his followers that the world would be under nuclear war on July 15, 1967, and that the temple would be moved to Northern California to keep it safe. An attack could come without warning. The sky would suddenly light up. If a doorway is right at hand, use it. If the nearest shelter is more than a couple of steps away, fall to the ground immediately. If the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki had known what we know about civil defense, 
thousands of lives would have been saved. Yes, the knowledge is ours, and preparation can mean survival for you. From then on, the People's Temple grew at an exponential rate, and new branches opened in San Fernando, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Eventually, Jones relocated the headquarters to San Francisco, which made him an influential figure in politics. Redwood Valley was a friendly place with good climate, plentiful jobs, and beneficial welfare. He established a commune with housing for his followers, and he opened nursing homes for the aged. His integrated church attracted many middle-class whites who believed in his gospel of socialism. We haven't been loved for a month. It's been too busy. We have about every uh, level of society, all the economic income straight in, professional down to the ordinary field worker, field labor. I was deeply moved by his uh, persuasive manner and his uh, charisma. He continued to increase his political power by making new connections with more politicians, and his following grew with him as well. Well, aside from being a religious leader, the Reverend Jim Jones also wanted to be a political force. It was there in Ukiah where Jones apparently established a pattern of popularity among political figures. In Los Angeles, a spokesman for the, from the district attorney's office told the LA Times that their six-month investigation had been deliberately squelched because of Jones, Jones's influence among local politicians. The spokesman said his office had received letters from influential people trying to head off the investigation. Jones delivered large blocks of votes, he said. Our investigation went nowhere. In San Francisco, the DA's office had received complaints ranging from child abduction to homicide. Aside from the uh, Reverend Jim Jones's desire certainly to control and dominate the bodies and the souls of his church members, Jones also understood the value of politics and the advantage of knowing and aiding elected officials. In San Francisco, he became a conspicuous and welcome part of the Democratic Party. One of the many candidates he helped was San Francisco Mayor George Moscone, who in 1976 appointed the Reverend Jones as chairman of the San Francisco Housing Authority. I think, first of all, you overrate political influence, but, but if you mean why, why Governor Brown would speak at uh, yeah. his church, why I would be there, the district attorney, Senator Marks, Diane Feinstein, all kinds of people, it was very simple. Uh, those events were major events, the celebration of the, of the anniversary of the death of Martin Luther King, and, and that's where the event was to take place. Interestingly, the People's Temple also grew simultaneously to have more extreme and bold ideas. In the late 60s, Jones was openly supporting communism and taught his followers to label capitalist America as a sin. First, it would have to be, this would be required. You would have to be socialistic to be able to trust the Bible. The only ethic by which we can lift mankind today is some form of socialism. There is a smattering of it in the, in the New Testament. They brought their possessions to the apostles' feet, and the apostles departed and departed to every man as he had need, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Now, we've been told that this was a Marxian, a Marxist, uh, concoction, but it isn't. It's, it's older than <clears throat> the Bible by far. It's a couple of thousand years, and then even more than that in, in its age. You can tr you can trust no judgment that is not based upon the highest ethic of socialism. By the early 70s, he was denouncing Christianity and the Bible for oppressing non-whites and women. He even wrote his own criticism of the King James Bible, titled "The Letter Killeth." At the same time, Jones claimed that he was also the reincarnation of Gandhi, Father Divine, Buddha, and Lenin. But Jones' luck was running out. A number of his followers were feeling disillusioned about him and they happened to mention their concerns to David Kahn, a normal citizen concerned for the safety of the temple's advocates. 
to leave People's Temple, you had to decide you'd rather die than, than continue to go there and see the beatings and, and the mistreatment of people, the rip-off of senior black people from their homes, all their property. Uh, you had to decide that you were ready to die when you left the church. To, to think that people are so damn picky about who they go to bed with, and particularly you women, all you have to do is lay there, and by God, I've had to keep it going all night. The only thing I can do is to be an aggressive heterosexual with a man or woman. I don't care whatever you want me, me, you be the woman. I would do that for socialism. I told you there, I've had to crawl in bed with men and put up with for this cause. I've had to lay with women I hated till my skin crawled. We'd get on these buses that he, he purchased, these Greyhound buses. We'd travel from San Francisco to Chicago, all across America in the summer. Bus number seven was Jim's bus. And in the back of his bus, he had his own private space. I didn't know it at the time, but on that same bus, there were many sexual encounters. When we got on the bus to go back to San Francisco, um, he sat down next to me and said, you don't realize how beautiful you are, do you? And he said, I'm attracted to you. And he told me to go into the back of the bus, and I waited there, and then the door opened. And it was John's. And he said, you're a beautiful girl, and you don't know that. And I want to show you that you are. And then he proceeded just to pull down his little zipper and screw me. And as I lay there, frightened, um, not sure what to do, and as I shivered, he'd say to me, this is for you. I'm doing this for you, Debbie. Call me father, call me mother, call me morphodite, call me queer, call me whatever you want. I don't care what you call me. I'm afraid of nobody. Punishment became a normal thing, and punishment went from you're going to write lines, this many lines for, you know, whatever you did wrong, to corporal punishment. The stuff that, that got to me the most was the, the public beatings uh, during meetings. He would say, Johnny Smith, come up here front and center. And so then the people in the congregation would say, get up there, get up there. I don't want to know you better talk. I want to know why you told them there was no weapons on the ghost crews. I want to know. And then he would say, I'm just disappointed in you. This is unacceptable behavior. And you are going to be punished for this. If it got really intense, people would be beaten. Get in there, Mary. Hold in there. That's it. Get in there. And they're beat till they're bloody. And Jim's snickering that sick giggle that he had in the background. <laughs> Man's getting a hell of a time up here. Hold in there, boys. Black and white together, you're having a little trouble. <laughs> They're turning blue. <laughs> He's, we, uh, we lost one white one. We got one black and one blue. When he heard of the suspicions and dishonesty regarding Jim Jones, Khan made it known to the police, the U.S. Treasury, newspaper reporters, and a government attorney. We had guards constantly around the church. We were constantly watching when we'd go to school or whatever. Hey, we were so af we were afraid to t we were afraid, afraid to talk to our own parents because when we did, we were turned in for being uh, negative. I'd gone through a false uh, mass suicide. I, I went through one talk and I went through one where we actually took a drink and we were told we had an hour to live so that Jones could find out how people would react psychologically. In his paranoia, Jones responded by fleeing to Guyana with his family and followers. But it was too late. David Kahn had already set in motion the process of events that would lead to the downfall of the People's Temple. When Jim Jones and his followers arrived in Guyana, they established a small living community, Jonestown, which was labeled by Jones as a model communist community. This is a beautiful place here, and you can you can see how all the banana plants and everybody here is really enjoying here, and I really do like it. And I'm just so glad to be a part of this down here, to be able to work and build a land. 
I am really grateful to be a part of this family. I really don't have any desire whatsoever <laughs> to come back to the United States ever. We were working 18 hours a day, but we were seeing the fruit of our labor. There was real passion about what we were doing. Here are the people at the table eating an afternoon snack. You see Pepsi Cola's here for three cents. American money. These are potato chips made from plantain, and they're more delicious. They're a combination of a potato chip and a French fry. And radishes, mm mm mm. You don't know what you're missing down here. The elements of a cult, however, were starting to leak, and people were starting to become disillusioned with the charm of Jones. For example, the movement of the followers were heavily restricted. You could check into Jonestown anytime, but you can never leave. Additionally, Jones' drug addiction became known among his rank and file members, further decreasing his charisma. The American man is nothing like these. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Furthermore, the soil of the jungle that Jonestown was located in was too thin to grow food on, so people were starving and had to beg in the streets of the market to bring food back to Jonestown. To make matters worse, Jones regularly had sex with both male and female temple members while he openly condemned premarital and extramarital sex himself. What liberation brings? They showed people dancing and having fun, and he told us you can go to college, you can swim, you can fish. Uh, it never gets real, real hot. All lies. None of it was true. I mean, he sold us a bill of goods. I think Dad always knew he was a fraud, and what people seemed to think he was, was not who he was. Eventually, a number of people worried for the followers of the People's Temple, called the Concerned Relatives, were putting pressure on government officials to take a look at the People's Temple's suspicious behavior. Nobody knew what was going on at Guiana, and what was it like to be there? Well, some ex-members, people who had been in the church for years, and quit, contacted me and said, you don't know the half of it. And it wasn't until the magazine New West prepared an expose that people understood the scope of what Reverend Jim Jones was doing. Jim Jones, the philanderer, the extortionist of old people. Jim Jones, the drug abuser. He can no longer manage perception of him the way he used to. The facade is coming apart. Eventually, the political support that Jones had worked hard for dissolved into nothing. The writing was on the wall for Jonestown when Congressman Leo Ryan visited Jonestown with a crew of former Temple followers, a cameraman, and newspaper reporters. Jim Jones was ready to welcome them. People play games, friend. They lie, they lie. What can I do about liars? Are you people going to leave us? I just beg you, please leave us. Bill, we will bother nobody. But this was a very short-lived welcome. Ryan was attacked with a knife, shot, and killed, along with four other people that came with him by Jones's personal guard, the Red Brigade. Jim Jones was power hungry, but he was not stupid. He knew that Jonestown and the People's Temple was now over. Jim Jones, shortly after his confrontation with Ryan, ordered for his followers to drink Kool-Aid poisoned with cyanide. They invaded our privacy, they came into our home, they Let's get calm, let's get calm. Be patient, be patient. 
Various accounts even mention children being forced to participate and people unknowingly drinking the poison. About 900 people died in Jonestown. A third of them were children. In his own room, Jones kills himself with a bullet to the head. And now, questions remain unanswered about the entire ordeal. How much of a role did Jim Jones' cult leadership style play in the deaths of his followers? Were his followers able to exercise free will when they died? Were they able to exercise free will when they followed him to Guyana? Were they able to exercise free will when they joined the People's Temple? And finally, the ultimate question. Are the deaths of Jonestown more accurately portrayed as murders or suicides? The psychological reasonings, scientific evidence, and philosophical theories that are related to the events of Jonestown seems to point towards the deaths being a homicide. Jim Jones very purposely manipulated his followers' trust and was highly educated in his methods to do so. Well, the fact that Jim Jones cared nothing for you but what he could get out of you, Jim Jones used every politician. I wouldn't condemn anybody for being caught up in Jim Jones. I mean, he was a very shrewd man. He appealed to people on the civil rights, on the injustices in the society. All displays of deviance from his followers in Jonestown were met with harsh punishments, and thus instilled fear and inhibited action against him from his supporters. As for scientific evidence, there were signs of forceful injection of poison in some of the bodies found. He was telling them not to tell the children that they were dying, not to tell them it was painful, and that people had to die with dignity. And finally, we can theoretically state that many of the advocates of Jim Jones were forced to work without payment and dehumanized and therefore had no free will and responsibility over their deaths. Their leader, Jim Jones, did. The primary thing that you see with violent cult leaders is that they will never give up control. They are never going to be in a position in which they abdicate, resign. They would rather go forward into a violent confrontation with society, as occurred in Waco, or into a mass suicide, as has occurred in Jonestown. It's difficult to understand what his goal really was. I don't think it was personal fame and fortune. Um, certainly he did not live a higher lifestyle from those of his members. His goal may have been to create a name for himself. Initially it may have been to create a better society for Americans. But in the end, I think that his goal was release from his personal pain and anguish over his own life. The popular media often distorts the facts of a horrendous incident. In this case, many people mistakenly believe to this day that Jonestown was a mass suicide. But the mounting evidence and stories we researched lead us to believe that Jim Jones murdered 900 of his own people in cold blood.
Somehow.